Now, through what is called microarray technology, we can actually look at, in today's world, 22,000 genes, know their expression up or down in a variety of different settings. And we can have that information back within a period of 24 to 48 hours. There are two major types of microarrays. There's what are called cDNA arrays, which is where you take the RNA backbone and you actually put two primer links on it and translate it. So you know the way DNA and RNA translate? Well, we've actually taken that technology out of the cell and used primer linkers, and the primers are actually nucleotides, and then we actually run an enzyme that actually just builds the building block again. And using that technology, um, a group from Stanford University in the US actually developed what was called cDNA array technology. Oligonucleotide arrays were developed um, by a company called Affymetrix, uh, again initially based in California. And Affymetrix actually developed smaller type arrays which were um, small oligonucleotides. And oligonucleotides are small sequences of nucleotides or the building blocks of DNA. But the important thing was they were able to actually do this in such a way that these things could be put onto silicon or glass. So then you were suddenly able to take representative segments from each gene and actually put it on a backbone that you could begin to use to screen. And that was a very simple technological advance in reality, but its impact has been massive, as I'm going to show you in just a minute. The application of this technology is actually vast. First of all, it's going to, and is already beginning to, uh, lead to the identification of genes that are involved in early disease. So we are now um, developing a host of genes that actually we know are associated with early disease. Our problem actually is no longer discovering genes. It's actually getting through all the information that we get and actually trying to make sense of it. And of course these can become great new screening tools eventually. And that's one of the um, things that I think is going to lead to this revolution. We will begin to reclassify disease. We will begin to reclassify tumors, the extent of tumors, and where their primary organ is, etc., etc. And the reason we're going to do that is because, again, this technology is going to help us do that. When Dr. Black and I were being educated, we were educated based on um, the primary organ side of a disease, its somatic uh, relationships. So colon cancer, breast cancer, are defined based on the anatomic side. We are now in an age where that is actually becoming, in my view, relevant but not as relevant as it once was. Because we can begin to take colon cancer, and I'll show you this in a minute, and divide it into colon cancer type A, B, C, D and E. No longer based on how far it has spread, let's say to lymph nodes or across the wall of the colon or one side of the breast to the other, or to lymph nodes. But we can base it upon what genes are actually functionally working within that particular tumor. And that has significant ramifications for everything beyond it, especially for defining in a much more um, precise way patient prognosis, for the prediction of outcome to therapy and toxicity, and of course, for the identification of newer treatments. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Some of you in the audience will be aware of the BRCA1 story. It was a three-year sequencing project to find it back in the early 1990s. It was eventually discovered by a group at UCSF, um, and it became one of the uh, biggest breast cancer and indeed ovarian cancer associated genes for approximately 18% of those patients who get breast cancer. And so this was a huge finding. Well, one of the things that Paul Harkin, um, who's a senior investigator in the Cancer Research Center, did uh, and began at Harvard, but actually brought the work to Belfast, um, was he began to actually tease apart what genes are regulated by BRCA1 when it's working properly versus when it's not working properly. And as a result of this, Dr. Harkin actually pulled out five very, very important genes, which are now the subject of an international trial in ovarian cancer, and one that will begin shortly in breast cancer. 
The most important of these was a DNA damage related gene called GAD45. And so one of the studies that's now being done as part of the, what's called the IVIS study is actually trying to define whether these target genes for this breast cancer associated gene actually are important predictors for who will get breast cancer and who should get a certain intervention. Another component of this actually relates to work that I've done in my own group, um, with a group from Chicago and from Pittsburgh, where we've taken patients with colorectal cancer um, across all stages. And we've actually done expression profiling, and these little dots represent a gene. Each dot represents a gene. A red dot actually represents one that's overexpressed. A green one represents one that's underexpressed. And what we've done then is we've handed these to people who are much more intelligent than I am, i.e. the biomaticians, and they've actually said, wow, there are different populations here. And this is stuff that's going to be published very shortly in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where we actually have been able to begin to build a gene profile and actually link that gene profile with survival in populations of patients who have metastatic colon cancer, all of whom you would have treated as a single population before. But as you can see here, if you had one genetic profile, in other words, genetic profile A, your survival was actually around about 22 months. So in actual fact, for metastatic colorectal cancer, and this is without any treatment, uh, you're actually doing very well. Whereas profile B, in actual fact, your median survival is around about six months. So this is the target population here that you really want to define a very active treatment for, rather than a heterogeneous population that actually behave very differently clinically. So this type of analysis obviously leads to the following clinical paradigm. This is a piece of what's called a hematoxin and eosin stain of a colon cancer in someone with an early tumor confined to the colon. Because we can now develop this genetic signature, we can, absolutely, we can begin to develop gene signatures and actually then define relapse hazard scores so that I and others like me can actually, on an individual basis, begin to tell you much, much more precisely what your chances of relapse are, are if you have a certain type of cancer. And this is the whole integration of genomics and pathology that I believe is going to revolutionize care over the next decade and a half. Another application of this is beginning to understand genes that are actually involved in the way our cells respond to a drug. And when you take any drug, it doesn't have to be chemotherapy, but when you take a drug, you actually alter metabolism in some way. And of course, with chemotherapy, one of the big issues is, well, will you respond to that drug? Or are you going to get very toxic on that drug? And so we've begun to use this technology to actually highlight genes that can actually predict both toxicity and response. I just show, this is a dendritogram, or what we call a heat map, that actually shows in the parental sensitive populations, we can come up with 855 genes that are actually going to predict for sensitivity to fluorouracil, and a group of 94 genes that actually tell us that if these are expressed, these patients should most definitely not get this compound. Now that, again, has implications for treatment because somebody comes along with a diagnosis of breast cancer, stage two, they get three drugs, cytoxin, methotrexate, fluorouracil. Well, I'm automatically saying that if they have overexpression of these genes, there's absolutely no way they should get that drug. In actual fact, they may get very serious toxic consequences as a result. The other thing that this has allowed us to do is to actually begin to define and actually identify targets for new drug development in a given clinical context. So this is work from my own group that has actually discovered a molecule called C-flip. This may be difficult to see, but C-flip actually stops these death receptors. This is called the fast ligand binding to the FAS receptor, which is part of a, a sort of a normal death pathway. But this molecule actually is heavily induced when you acutely treat cancer cells with chemotherapy. And so what the cells are doing is they're actually using this 
molecule, this protein, to actually circumvent the cytotoxic insult. And so one of the projects that we've now begun with the Institute for Cancer Research in Sutton is to actually develop small molecules to that protein to actually see if in actual fact it would allow those cells to die. The whole drug discovery apparatus and methodology has changed out of all sight. In um, the early 1990s, I remember having a conversation with um, Bruce Chadner, who's now the director of oncology at Harvard, where we were talking about the um, dearth of new active drugs in cancer care. And part of the reason we were talking about it was that in colon cancer and indeed in breast cancer, we weren't really making the types of advances that we wanted to. Um, and along came a drug called Taxane, which we got from the bark of the yew tree, and uh, which we began to understand much better. And that was the only real drug in the early 1990s that gave any sort of um, hope of new advances in cancer care. As you'll see in just a minute, that has changed out of all of sight. And the reason for that is the way we went about drug discovery historically, drug discovery actually came out of World War II. It actually really came out of World War I. Um, and it actually came out of the mustard gas development program. Mustard um, was actually the first chemotherapy compound. And uh, when people started testing uh, the mustings, as they come to be called in Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, they actually found that they had activity in leukemia. And that was in the early 1940s. Um, alkylating agents came shortly after that. And that's why in the 1960s then, we began to see uh, young people who had leukemia beginning to actually respond to these drugs and survive. And now leukemia, especially in young people, uh, but even in older people, is no longer a killer disease. But if you live back in the 1950s and 1940s, it was definitely a killer disease. Nobody survived. And there, what happened back then was we discovered an active drug because the chemist made a compound and we tested it. And so we had things like methotrexate, uh, which is used for osteogenic sarcoma. Some of you may remember the stories around Ted Kennedy's son back in the 1970s. He was one of the first patients in the world to get high-dose methotrexate. He also had an amputation, but he's alive today. Tell the tale. Um, also, the mustards I've mentioned, platinum complexes were the huge revolution in ovarian cancer. If you were a, a lady, young lady with ovarian cancer in the 1970s, you were not curable. Uh, now, in actual fact, um, you are curable, largely due to this drug, and also then taxines came along as a big plus as well. But what do we do now? Well, in a very, very short period of time, what we've now done, begun to do is take the genetic profile of tumors and identify associations between molecular genetic events, tumor development, and progression, as I've outlined. And already out of that, we have a number of drugs which have revolutionized certain diseases, such as chronic myeloid leukemia, where we have uh, there's a fusion protein called bcr abo and also GI stromal cell, cell tumors, which was no treatment for four years ago or five years ago. Now we have Glevi curing 70% of these and actually also curing 60% um, of CMLs just before they go into blast crisis. These patients would have had to go to transplantation prior to that. Other ones are, this is an oncogene in breast cancer called CRB2 or HER2. Um, Herceptin has come along which targets this protein and which has actually suddenly uh, increased um, the chances of survival for patients with metastatic breast cancer. Lung cancer and colorectal cancer, we've had EGFR inhibitors, which I'll show you in just a minute, both small molecule and what we call antibody therapies. And here's how these types of therapies work. We identify on the cancer cells, so this is epidermal growth factor inhibition using what are called monoclonal antibodies. And this therapy is now approved and in treatment for metastatic colorectal cancer and being tested in earlier cancers as we speak. But all it does is attack the epidermal growth factor receptor and stop a little protein that normally binds to that from actually activating that pathway. And why have we got this? Well, because we actually began to understand the role of the epidermal growth factor in the transformation process and growth process 
of cancers like colorectal and breast cancer. We've also taken exactly the same concept, and rather than, than attacking the external domain, we've actually attacked the internal domain using what are called small molecules. And there we're actually attacking what are called um, kinases or phosphatases that activate the intracytoplasmic domain. Now some of you sitting in this audience are actually going to make these drugs in the future. You're actually going to be the guys who develop these ideas. You're also going to be the guys who actually discover some of these targets that actually become relevant for this type of development. And some of us sitting in this room are actually going to be able to benefit from their discovery because they may ameliorate and actually get rid of the disease that we actually take or have. So this is where we are now. I said to you in 1991 we had only one cancer compound in active development that was exciting. There are actually now a total of 300 compounds in active development, clinical development for cancer between North America and Europe as we speak. And probably about 70 of those are competing to actually get into um, first or second line cancer care, hitting targets that are the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the cell surface, and a variety of other places. And this revolution is not going to go away, it is going to grow exponentially. And that's the challenge to us clinically, how do we cope with this? So, how do we cope with it? What are now the implications for clinical practice of this? Well, the first thing is, because we now are in what we call the Advanced Technology Initiative, we, as a clinical and research community, have to catalyze the discovery and development of these 21st century medicines. And we have to begin to find ways to more effectively deliver them to patients with disease. The way we're going to do that is by not only taking genomics, shown here, but also proteomics, which is, this is the gels on which you actually separate various proteins. These bands are individual proteins. And then using things like metabolomics, molecular imaging, which I'll show you in just a minute, and very importantly, now technology, we're going to start actually revolutionizing how we deliver these things to patients. Part of that exploration and development, though, has to be an integrated approach. And this is where the Comprehensive Cancer Center linked internationally becomes so important because you can't do this on your own either as an individual uh, or as an individual center and so what we have to do to accelerate the pace and ability to translate this is to go quickly from model systems letting us understand our clinical biology using computer or what we call in silico biology using tools that actually allow us to actually develop and harness the information from genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, and then insert that into clinical trials and treatment, but comprehensively gather that data in a manner that actually allows us to actually understand why things work and why things don't work. And this actually is the rationale for two very big international projects. One is called CA Big, which is the Cancer Bioinformatics Program, and then what's called the Cancer Grid Program here, in Europe and the UK, which Belfast is one of the leaders of. This molecular imaging is going to allow us to do things in terms of in vivo, in model systems, where we can image drugs in the tumor. That little red dot is actually uh, epidermal growth factor receptor being targeted. It's also going to allow us to actually look at cells as they're being destroyed. This is actually a cell that's actually lysing, it's actually breaking in two. Very importantly, it's going to allow us to take this technology into patients such that, and I'll just point out that this is PET CT. We will be one of only two sites in the UK with a PET CT as of next year. But the important thing about this PET CT is if you compare it to this CT scan, there's nothing wrong with this CT scan. Now look at this PET CT. Here is actually a little liver lesion that you couldn't see. So in other words, we're actually able to begin to find very, very early stage disease. This modeling here is called spec scanning, which actually follows a drug given to a patient with a fluorescence tag on. And what it can this tells us 
is that this has actually got into the tumor. And we can actually do this in patients today. So all of this diagnosis and monitoring in real time can actually happen. But we've got to want it to happen, and we've got to make sure that our patients get access to it. A very practical example, and one that's not widely available yet, but one we're pushing for, is actually in the um, area of breast cancer imaging and screening. Today, um, women over the age of 50 in the UK will get screened, and then those at higher risk actually get screened younger. But as some of you will know in the room, the reality is that those images, those mammograms, actually can be very, very difficult to interpret. And where you have small lesions, in actual fact, the ability to detect those takes a very, very trained eye, and they can be missed easily. So there is a high false positive rate. However, with the more recent DCE MRI technology that has arrived, you can, you can actually detect very small cancer lesions that are very hard to find on mammography. And this actually shows that very clearly. There's a suggestion that there's a shadow here, and to the untrained eye that's difficult to see. I think you can all see from the MRI that there's absolutely no question that this unfortunate lady has a significant breast cancer lesion. And this is the type of technology advances that are actually allowing us to diagnose tumors earlier and earlier at stages where things can become much more curable. The final technology area that I want to allude to is the one that's going to, I think, become very apparent very quickly over the next two to five years. And that's the area of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is really technologies that do things in the nano scale. That's all it is. In a decade's time, we'll be talking about femtotechnology, and probably a couple of years after that, we'll be talking about something quite different. So the reality is now, with nanotechnology, we are able to build particle sizes that are so small. And with that reality, we can now build powerful biosensors that actually we can put into patients, put into their bone marrow, and actually it can sense mutations. So we can actually put DNA onto these little wafers, and if we get a hybridization signal, we get a fluorescent signal given off. And that then can be used by the imaging technologies to actually diagnose very early disease. We also have nanowires that are actually going to be used for high throughput detection of many, many genes, as well as changes in gene expression. There also are what are called nanocantilevers, which actually will be able to measure very small protein levels in serum. But the, the last two are the ones that the public is going to hear most about. Um, and they are, first of all, nanoshells, which, to which will be attached antibodies or um, small molecules. And these, because of their size, will be able to get into tumor beds, cross boundaries in a manner we haven't been able to do before, to ablate tumors, and also to image tumors. And you will be able to put multiple tags on these. So you can put a chemical on one side and put a fluorescent antibody on the other. So you can actually watch what you're doing as it's happening. The other thing that's happening right now is the development of nanoparticles, in particular for diagnostics and imaging, but more particularly for a new era of drug delivery, where you will actually be able to deliver higher concentrations of drug to your target site. What does all this mean? Well, it means that we're moving into an era of better drugs, and because of that, better quality of life for patients with cancer. So they don't have to be in hospital, they don't have to be afraid of having cancer anymore, they know that there is hope. And that will extend to both chemotherapy, to monoclonal antibodies and targeted therapy, and to prevention medicines, such as some of the aromatase inhibitors that are currently being tested. So, a challenging time today and a challenging time ahead. Conquering cancer is no longer something that is just a medical nicety or something that we sweep under the carpet and don't talk about anymore. It is something we have to face up to as we have to face up to any disease. But conquering it is not only going to be a medical issue, it's going to be a medical, scientific and engineering challenge. Because the advances that actually come about in cancer care um, come up because chemists have gone on board, biologists have gone on board, 
radiologists have gone on board, physicists have gone on board, um, and medical doctors have gone on board. And it's going to require an integrated biology and clinical program. These nanotech alliances that are developing are actually, I think, going to revolutionize some of the ideas that come forward. We have the Cancer Genome Anatomy Project, which was sequencing the whole um, cancer genome, but then taking those genes that were responsible for cancer out and putting them in separate databases. This is a major reference tool for all of us now. Biomarker Project is a big international project for developing proteins that actually are markers for disease. And I've already talked about CA Big and Cancer Grid as the big integrated clinical and bioinformatics project. Of course, these all need strong clinical research programs. They also, of course, present a different challenge. If we're actually going to be able to get rid of the cancer cell, we have to face up to the fact that we have now got the enabling technologies. We also have the intellectual capital. But what we will have to face up to are the financial resources that will be needed to actually make this transferable for the cancer patient. There are also other challenges that I think we as a society have to also begin to grapple with. And they first of all are that some of these issues raise major ethical, legal and moral issues. So, you're a young woman, you're 22 years old, there's nothing wrong with you. But unfortunately, your mom died at the age of 35 from breast cancer. And you go and see Dr. Black in St. James's Street, and you say, Dr. Black, you know, I'm really worried. I think I might be at risk for breast cancer. Dr. Black knows that he can actually send her for screening to determine whether she is one of the unfortunate women who has a genetic risk. But what Dr. Black can't do is reassure her that there's a therapeutic modality out there today that will actually completely get rid of that risk. And the problem, therefore, is that we're now moving, and I come back to what I said, the clinical paradigm shift is one where back in the 40s and 50s we dealt with killer infectious diseases, the TB asylums. They're all gone. Why? Because we've got good drugs to cure those diseases. We've now moved in the cancer era to having drugs that actually treat advanced cancer, but we're moving away from that as well. We're now moving to actually targeting populations that because of the molecular information that's out there, they're perfectly normal. So what do you do in the 18-year-old, the 20-year-old? And I suddenly say to you, you've got a very high risk of getting lung cancer, and you're a non-smoker. But that's the sort of paradigm shift that we're going to see, because we will have interventions for people like that, such that they need not fear the risk of getting cancer to the same extent. There are issues around patient understanding. You can't do this with only the doctor understanding this. The patient and their family have to understand it. There are privacy rules, there are insurance rules. You can imagine somebody going for life insurance after they've been given this type of risk analysis. There's a real tension between these rapid medical advances and, of course, access to them. I've already mentioned the issue of multidisciplinary collaboration. Primary care will have to become a major driver in this, because this isn't going to happen a tertiary care facility, we're treating the normal population, and of course, affordability. So, to conclude, in the cancer arena and in medicine in general, new technology has already transformed the way in which we must approach cancer treatment, early detection, and prevention. It now enables us to treat patients in a molecular disease and holistic context, which we were not able to do previously. However, these technologies are only tools, and as such, they're only as good as the manner in which they are applied to the patient. And therefore, the issues that arise as a result of this are, first of all, who is the appropriate patient, the appropriate population, and what is the appropriate intervention? How do we now begin to redefine disease? What is the cost and availability of all this going to be, and what is its impact on society? 